The title of our sermon this morning is Magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. Magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. And our passage is John chapter 3, verses 22 to 36. And we're going to be studying this passage uh, on the the tale, so to speak, of that conversation with Nicodemus, a glorious passage of Scripture. We come now to John chapter 3, verses 22 through 36. And in this passage, in John chapter 3, we're going through now a bit of a transition. John the Baptist was the last of the Old Testament prophets, so to speak. And the torch now is being passed. He had enjoyed great popularity for a time. The Bible says that all Judea was coming out to hear him preach and wanting to be baptized by him. But now Jesus Christ has come, the mediator of a new and better covenant. And after his miracles now and the cleansing of the temple, masses are coming out to follow Christ. And John is beginning like a a dimmer switch on your light, so to speak. John is beginning to dim as a light from the scene of history. And Jesus Christ has now come. Everything that the forerunner has come to do, the purpose of the forerunner, the mission of the forerunner, Everything that he's come to do is about magnifying the Lord Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah. And just like John the Baptist, that's our mission as well. We are sent to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ, to bear witness of him. We are to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ so that all those who come to believe in him as the Son, the Christ, might have life in his name. Now that happens through our words, through the preaching of the gospel, what we say. It also happens through our life. The content of our preaching and the substance of our lived out faith as we live in this world for the Lord Jesus Christ. That mission, both the preaching and the life, is beautifully exemplified for us in the great example of John the Baptist. We see that example here in John chapter 3. That's an example that we're to follow. We are to follow that example. The point of this passage... The point of John's ministry, and our point today is that we are privileged, blessed by God to be able to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ, both with our preaching and with our lives. There are many ways in which that is done here by John, and let's learn from his example. I want to give you over the next two weeks multiple ways from this passage that we can magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. Many ways that we see John magnifying the Lord Jesus Christ woven into this passage. And again, we're to follow that example. These are ways that we are also to magnify the Lord. First from verse 22, I want you to see that we are to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ with our labor. Magnify the Lord with labor. In verse 22, the Bible says, after these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea and there he remained with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Woven into this passage, we see John and his disciples, the Lord Jesus Christ and his disciples, laboring in the ministry. It begins in verse 22. So after these things, after the cleansing of the temple, after the miracles that we saw Jesus Christ performing during the feast week after Passover in Jerusalem, and after that profound conversation with Nicodemus by night, sometime after these things, Jesus and his disciples left the city of Jerusalem for the Judean countryside, and the work of the ministry continues. Now you think about it for a moment. Jesus and his disciples, John the Baptist, could have resided in Jerusalem. It was a city. There were many comforts there. There were a lot of people there. They could have stayed in the city and witnessed, but they left the comfort of the city because there was work to be done. They take off into the Judean countryside because the gospel had to be preached. There was a baptism of repentance that needed to be preached, and they took off into the countryside to do that. They left their conveniences behind. They left comfort behind. They went out into that countryside where there was no place for the son of man to lay his head. They went out into the countryside where... Birds have nests, foxes have holes in the ground, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. They went out into the countryside to do the work of the ministry. Now, once there, we see that Jesus both remained there with his disciples and, two, he baptized. Now, from chapter 4, verse 2, we know from there that it wasn't Jesus Christ himself that baptized. It was his disciples that baptized. But lest you think that's a contradiction between those two passages, think about it this way. Here, it is said that Jesus baptized, or his disciples baptized. The disciples were doing the baptizing under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
The Lord Jesus Christ in his office and in his authority took responsibility for those baptisms. In that sense, both Jesus and his disciples were baptizing. But people were coming out to hear him preach. In the same way that John the Baptist went out into the wilderness of Judea to preach repentance, to preach repent for the kingdom of heaven at hand, Jesus Christ continued that work and preached repentance himself. We know that from Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, where the Bible says, Jesus came preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That is to turn from your sin, to prepare your heart to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. It is to turn from your sin. People were responding to that call to repentance, and they were following that call with commitment with the symbol of baptism. They were being baptized. An outward symbol of an inward reality, an inward repentance in the heart displayed or manifested in an outward symbol of baptism. But let's focus for a moment on that word remain, dietrebe in the Greek, remain. There were a few different words that could have been used here for remain, but the Holy Spirit chose this particular word. Dietrebe is a word that means to spend time, but it carries the sense of working away that time. It literally means to rub through something, to wear it away, wear something away. In this sense, it means to labor with the time that you have. One dictionary, dictionary said, it is conceived of as vigorously rubbing away an allocation of time. The same word is used in Acts chapter 14, verse three, where Paul remained vigorously rubbed away an allocation of time that he had in a synagogue at Iconium, preaching the word of God and doing miracles. This word, dietreba, means to labor, spend lengthy time laboring. Here specifically, laboring to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ, laboring in ministry. Here it is laboring in the ministry. At the same time that Jesus and his disciples were laboring in the Judean countryside, north of Jesus in Anon, John the Baptist was also working. In verse 23, he was also laboring for the Lord and baptizing. Now it's interesting as a footnote, why did John the Baptist choose that spot? He chose that spot because the Bible says there was much water there. Now think about it for a moment and let's establish this as important. This is an example in scripture. There was much water there. He wouldn't have needed much water if all he was going to do was sprinkle or pour, right? But he needed much water. Why? Because baptism is immersion, is a plunging. That's what it means. It tells us much about the method and practice of baptism at that time. The word baptizo means to immerse. It means to plunge, to put under the water. You need something more than ankle deep water to do that, right? All you need is ankle deep water if you're going to sprinkle or pour. But if you're going to immerse, you need much water. That was the practice of baptism at that time. We need to do it right today. Follow the Lord's example and do baptism the way it's supposed to be done. This isn't Christian baptism, by the way. Not yet, but it's leading up to it. Christian baptism is a reflection, is a symbol of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christian baptism is instituted after those things take place. It is to picture the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is a baptism of repentance. Uh, in this sense, symbolizing a cleansing from sin or a turning from sin. And so they're baptizing, working here, laboring in the ministry. So John the Baptist, here, laboring in Anon for the Lord with the time that he had left. It's telling that verse, verse 24. Verse 24 gives us a little bit of an insight into John's ministry. Verse 24 says that John had not yet been thrown into prison. That simple little statement tells us a lot. One, it tells us that John's time is limited. John's time is limited. And we know what the end will be, the result of his labor for the Lord. That simple little statement is a testimony of how John the Baptist magnified the Lord Jesus Christ in his labor for him. John would soon be arrested by King Herod because he took a stand for righteousness. As we come to find out from the other gospels, John was eventually beheaded. So Jesus Christ labored for his father until his death. John labored for the Lord until his death. So here's the point. 
the glorious responsibility of the forerunner was to point people to Jesus Christ, to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ in his ministry. How did he do that? How did he do that? He did that by faithfully laboring in the ministry that the Lord gave to him. This wasn't as you go. This wasn't preserving John the Baptist's convenience or comfort. You know, John didn't wake up with a closet full of clothes and four or five or six or eight or 10 pairs of shoes to choose from. He wore camel's hair, a leather belt. He ate locusts and wild honey. And he was out in the Judean countryside laboring for the Lord. And he faithfully labored at that mission. Faithfully labored at that mission despite his circumstances until his death. And how did he faithfully labor? Why did he faithfully labor? Because he trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, because of faith in Christ. It was said that John the Baptist had the the Spirit of God from his birth. So in the, the empowerment and enablement of the Spirit of God, by faith in Christ and in the strength of the Spirit of God, John the Baptist magnified the Lord Jesus Christ with his labor for the Lord. You and I have the same mission. You and I have the same mission. We are to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ in our ministry for him, for all that Christ has done in our own hearts, in our own lives. We are walking trophies of the grace of God, and we are to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ who bought us with his own blood. And we too, filled with the Holy Spirit. Praise God that he doesn't give us the Spirit by measure, but he gives us everything that we need that pertains to life and godliness all of the spirit when we're born of God and we're to serve him. We're to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ with our labor. When I think about the the ministry of John the Baptist, I'm always reminded of one of my favorite passages of scripture. And I want you to turn there with me. It's Hebrews chapter 11. I love Hebrews chapter 11. And here we see those who have labored to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ with their ministry as well. Hebrews chapter 11. You know, it takes labor. It takes effort. It takes intention, it takes planning, it takes God's word, but it also takes faith, a courageous faith, an ambitious faith, determination, resolve, and it takes the Holy Spirit of God. Hebrews chapter 11, look down beginning at verse 30. Look at this passage of scripture. The Jewish Christians who got this letter were tempted in their circumstances to keep one foot in Christianity and the other foot in the world. One foot in Christianity, the other foot in Judaism and their false religion at the time. They were tempted to keep one foot following Christ, which was difficult and for which they would face persecution, and the other foot in their comfort, in their convenience, in what they were used to. They were chained up, so to speak, chained to those comforts, chained to false religion, chained to what had, they'd been brought up in. And the point here in Hebrews chapter 11 is to show them, show those Hebrew Christians that their Old Testament brothers and sisters were not like that. When their Old Testament brothers and sisters came to put faith in God, in the coming Messiah, they were all in. They were sold out, so to speak. When they put their faith in God, they put all of themselves into it. Look at verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. Now think about it for a moment. The Bible says that Jericho feared Israel, but also those citizens of Jericho probably thought it was a little bit ridiculous to see the Israelites circling the city, right? To see them out marching. But you don't hear, either here or in Joshua 6, where this is recounted for us, you don't hear about the Israelites complaining. You don't hear hear the Israelites saying anything about being embarrassed about going out and marching around the city seven times. You don't hear them grumbling. They trusted the Lord. And in faith, in the enablement of the Spirit of God, they went out and marched and blew trumpets and shouted, and the walls of Jericho came down. They just trusted God. And they went out and ministered, labored for the Lord. Verse 31, by faith, 
The harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe. Again, that's the word apathon. That's that word we've looked at just previously here. It means to disobey. Rahab did not perish with those who did not obey the Lord when she had received the spies with peace. Now think about it. Rahab was a prostitute. Rahab was a prostitute. And in faith, took a courageous stand for righteousness in a tremendously wicked city. Uh, Jericho was a tremendously wicked city. Heard of the stories about Jericho and those walls that came tumbling down when the Israelites marched around them seven times. Those walls were packed in with pots that the citizens of Jericho filled with live babies as a sacrifice to their gods for the protection of their city. Actually put live children in clay pots and walled them, cemented them into the walls around Jericho. It was a wicked city, a wicked city. And yet Rahab, a prostitute, by courageous faith, took a stand to magnify the Lord in her obedience to him. And Rahab here in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11 a prostitute who was the mother of Boaz, who married Ruth, the great-great-grandmother of David, an ancestor of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's awesome to think about. It's awesome to think about. Verse 32, he goes on, what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets. So many stories about these men. Gideon went into battle with 300 men that he chose from 32,000 men on the basis of how they lapped water from a stream. Took 32,000, narrowed it down, narrowed it down again, 300. Those 300 then, great courageous faith, right? Great courageous faith in the Lord, ambitious to magnify their Lord with their obedience to him, went into battle with trumpets and pots with torches in them went in to fight an innumerable army. They were, in, they were greatly outnumbered. Went to fight the battle with trumpets and pots and torches in them. Great faith. They obeyed the Lord. Verse 33, all these through faith, it says here, subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong. They became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured. Listen to this. They were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they, because they wanted to obtain a better resurrection. They were tortured not accepting deliverance because of the resurrection that they were looking forward to. We have a great resurrection. There's a resurrection. There's an inheritance that you, if you are in Christ by repentant faith, you have a glorious resurrection to look forward to, a glorious inheritance. What will you give up to serve the Lord? Some of you won't give up the convenience of an hour at home to go out and share the gospel with lost people. Maybe you won't give up the discomfort of the fear of man to go out and talk to a lost person about Christ. Just too uncomfortable to you, too inconvenient. We have such leisure. We're so prone to be sucked in by the leisures and comforts and pleasures of this world that we won't sacrifice, we won't diligently put forth effort to go out and serve the Lord, to see that the Lord Jesus Christ is magnified by our labor for him. They weren't willing to take the easy, out, the easy way out by denying the word of God, by denying God. They weren't willing to take the easy way out, but willing to face whatever comes, whether it's torture or death or in our day and age, a little bit of discomfort a little bit of inconvenience, right? A little bit of time out of our schedule. They would take even torture and death because of the resurrection that they were looking forward to, that they were waiting for. 
Verse 36 goes on. Still others had trial of mockings. That's a mental anguish, right? That's a, um, a, a mental drain to put up with that, that verbal persecution, right? We face that today, don't we? The trial of mockings. But then he also says, and scourgings. That's physical, physical persecution. They were under physical persecution. And of chains and of imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, being afflicted, being tormented. Is that the kind of Christianity we see today? No, but that's what they faced for the Lord. That's what they faced for the Lord. Look at what they gave up to serve Him. They gave up their own comfort They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, giving up everything to follow the Lord, being afflicted, being tormented. Listen to this. Of whom this ridiculous, wicked, deplorable world was not worthy. This world is not even worthy. They should have been present among us. <laughs> they wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. I said, brothers and sisters, this, this faith is a costly faith. The Bible says that we are to count the cost in coming to Christ. But what cost have you paid? Think about it for a moment. If you're following the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you're paying a price for your faith. Are you not? But what cost? Examine your own heart. Examine your condition. Examine your situation now. What cost at this point in time, in our circumstance, often the most we have to give up is our time, is some conveniences, maybe some leisure. Does the Lord want us to rest? Amen. Rest is a gift from God. But we're not to be consumed by that. We have an eternity to rest. Now we are to labor to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. Will you give up some of your time? Will you give up some of your comfort, some of your leisure to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ with your labor? This is to be a costly faith. It's to be an ambitious faith, a determined faith, a courageous faith. God doesn't promise you comfort, doesn't promise you convenience. And we are not to be enslaved and trapped with the trappings of this wicked world. We're not to be chained to our comforts and our leisures and our pleasures. We're to labor. We're to exercise a costly faith and we're to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ with our labor for him. Verse 39 goes on. All these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. In other words, they didn't receive the immediate blessing or the immediate deliverance, but they were looking forward to the ultimate promise of Christ, the ultimate promise promises being fulfilled. Verse 40, God having provided something better for us, that's the new covenant, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. And verse 12, the exhortation, listen, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. It's not here as if you're running before this cloud of witnesses in heaven that is looking down on you, approving or disapproving. Our approving is from the Lord Jesus Christ alone. We, with our running, magnify the Lord Jesus Christ alone. But we, as they did, are to run. I'm frequently reminded of James's prayer, uh, speaking of how we are, a man, are men and women like Elijah was. Elijah, a man like us, prayed that the heavens would be shut up for three years from rain. And what happened? The heavens were shut up from rain. And he's a man just like we are, with the Spirit of God just like we have. We're to serve as they did. We're to run with endurance the way that they ran. We're to drop the weight of apathy Drop that weight of weariness or indifference. You've got to drop that. 
Drop the ball and chain of your comforts and conveniences or leisures. Drop the ball and chain of your blame shifting for all the excuses that you make for why you don't fervently serve the Lord. Listen, stop the excuses. Don't allow yourself to make excuses. Drop those and serve. Labor for the Lord, magnifying the Lord Jesus Christ with your labor. Drop that sin that so easily ensnares us. It may just be sin of neglect. It may just be the sin of laziness, sluggardliness. Maybe the sin of apathy or the sin of indifference. But we serve the Lord Jesus Christ and we have an eternal inheritance. This life is a vapor. It's passing. It's going to go away. We're going to be in heaven one day. Run with endurance now. It's interesting there we're to run. We're not to jog. We're not to fast walk, you know. (laughs) We're not to sit. We're not to lie down. We're to run in a race. If you're going to run in a race, it requires great endurance. It requires great effort, great determination. You can't slow down when the going gets tough. Do you get tired in a race? Absolutely. But you keep pressing on. You run with endurance. The one who is out to win doesn't stop when their muscles start to ache. They press through. When they fall down, they get up, they keep running. There are going to be times when you feel exhausted. I completely relate to that. There are times when I feel exhausted. There are times when we're prone to be weary. Times when we're prone to give up, to throw in the towel. That's where faith comes in. That's where strength by God's Spirit comes in. You're to get back in the race. You may suffer for a while. Your thoughts may be occupied, squirrel. You know, you get out of the race for a short period of time. Listen, you're to get your focus back on the race, back on the Lord Jesus Christ, on the ministry that the Lord has given you. You're not to spend your time out of the race. We have a limited allocation of time and we are to labor vigorously rubbing away that time in service to the Lord. That's what this is talking about here. We're to get in the race. Paul says to run like you're the one who's going to win. Run like you're the one who's going to win. That means ambition for the Lord. That means determination. That means courage, discipline, effort, willpower, commitment means strength, and it means faith. It doesn't promise that it's going to be easy, and when it's tough, it requires faith. And that's faith exemplified for us in chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We're to endure this race in Christ in the power of the Spirit of God. If we get weary, if you're tempted to slow down, if you're tempted to drop out, we are to, verse three, consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your own souls. And you have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. Some of you won't resist the TV striving against sin. Some, some won't resist laziness in the word of God to strive against sin. We're so wickedly and deplorably sucked in by comfort, sucked in by leisure. We've got to fight against that. We've got to fight against it. Use your time for the Lord. You need to rest. But the rest that you take, take so that you can get back into faithful service for the Lord. Don't be a slave to comfort, a slave to rest, a slave to pleasure. You've got to fight against those things and serve the Lord. If you won't fight against a lack of discipline with your schedule, you've got to turn from that and serve the Lord. Put him in your schedule. Serve the Lord. Fight against your own laziness, your own sluggardliness with reading the word of God, with being around the people of God, with serving the Lord faithfully, intentionally in evangelism. Get back in the race. Is, is all of this in Hebrews 11, is this all just theoretical? Just theoretical. Now this is, this is the ideal, you know, no one's capable of this. This is not how we're to really aspire to live the Christian life. 
Is it just theoretical here? No, it's not theoretical. These are brothers and sisters of ours, Old Testament saints who lived this. We have a mission too. Just as they were sent with a mission, just as John the Baptist was to labor for the Lord, to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ, we have a responsibility with the talents that have been given to us to labor for the Lord, to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, think about the people outside of the church that you've known. People that you know outside of the church, many of them you know because of their work, right? Frank is an engineer, Sally is a teacher. Maybe you think of them in terms of a passion. You know, Frank is an environmentalist. Sally spends all her time with the PTA. You think about them, the way that they are associated with what they do, their passions. Are you the sports fanatic, right? Maybe you are the fitness nut. What is magnified is what you spend your time and energy and resources doing. You want to magnify the fitness industry? Well, then you'll be a fitness nut. You want to magnify Mother Earth? You'll be an environmentalist. (laughs) It's what you talk most about. It's what you spend your resources on. It's what you spend your time doing. It's what you post most on social media, right? It's what connects you to other people when you're around them. Your ministry, if you're with Christ, if you're in Christ, your ministry is to run for Christ. If you claim to be a Christian, your ministry is to labor to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not to magnify your hobbies, not to magnify your work, not to magnify anything else, but the Lord Jesus Christ. And you magnify him by being great at your work. You magnify him by doing that hobby with excellence, if you're going to do that. You magnify him by the way that you labor with your family to have a godly family or a godly marriage. You magnify the Lord in what you do, but your labor is to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember when I first came to Cornerstone, before I came to Cornerstone, I was told about a brother from this church. Um, I didn't know what he did for a living. I didn't know anything about him. Didn't know where he was from. But the guy who introduced us said this of him. He's always witnessing to me. (laughs) He was magnifying the Lord Jesus Christ to me before I even met him. His reputation went before him, so to speak. He was magnifying the Lord Jesus Christ to all those around him by witnessing. You know, some of you, myself included, some of us have been given five talents, some of us two, and others one. Writes the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25. Whether you've been given five, two, or one, I challenge you from the word of God to sit down and determine how you're going to invest those talents for the kingdom. How you will invest, listen, don't just let them sit under the ground and out of neglect not do anything with them. Take those talents that you've been given and determine how you're gonna invest them for the kingdom. How are you running the race right now? And if you're convicted about this, how are you gonna start running it today? What are you going to do today to run that race for the Lord? What will be your ministry for the Lord? Be ambitious. Your time is short. Spend this allocated time rubbing it away, laboring for the Lord. Magnify the Lord Jesus Christ with your labor. But next, we're to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ with our labor. We're also to magnify the Lord in contentment, with contentment. We see that back in John chapter 3, beginning at verse 25. It says there, there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. So while John and his disciples were preaching and baptizing, and baptizing by immersion, uh, a dispute ensued over their practice of baptism. Now, most likely it was their practice of baptism as it related to the Jewish practice of ceremonial cleansing. We don't know for sure, but in any event, it was about purification. It may have been a point about the effectiveness or the usefulness of their baptism or who should be baptizing because you had John and Jesus both baptizing and people running off to Jesus to be baptized by him and his disciples. And it prompted a response in verse 26, and that's the important issue here. It prompted this response 
from John's disciples about everyone running out to follow Jesus. And I want you to notice two things about the response in verse 26. One, I want you to notice the attitude of John's disciples. And then two, I want you to see the contrasting attitude of John the Baptist. First, the attitude of John's disciples. Look at the, the impersonal way in which they refer to Jesus. It's just he who was with you. It wasn't the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, right? That's what John was preaching. It was that one about whom you testified, that guy who is with you. And then note their exaggeration. All are going out to him, right? To them, everybody now is going out to Jesus. This is a demonstration of envy. This is a, a demonstration of discontentment, displeasure. They saw all the disciples of their master now trailing off, going off to follow Jesus Christ. And they were looking at this with disappointment. Disappointment at how the influence of Christ was increasing and discontentment over how the influence of John the Baptist was decreasing. But listen, while they were displaying envy, while they were displaying a lack of faith or discontentment, this is exactly what John the Baptist wanted. The whole purpose of his ministry was to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ, to point people to Christ. And so when he was seeing people running off to follow the, the Lord Jesus Christ, John the Baptist is full of joy, full of joy. His joy, according to verse 29, was fulfilled. That word means there, complete, like done. He is filled with joy that people are off following the Lord Jesus Christ. John the Baptist knew the plan of God he knew his role in it, and he trusted God for the results. He had great faith. He had a joyful faith, a humble faith, a content faith, and his joy was fulfilled. We're to have that kind of contentment. We are to remember, in order to be content, right, that contentment, that joy, is only possible for the Christian, only possible for one who is indwelt by God's Spirit, because that kind of joy that kind of joy that runs despite your circumstance is a spirit-wrought joy. It is a fruit of the Spirit. To have that joy, to have that contentment, we're to remember, we're to understand from Scripture, I'm sure John the Baptist also understood from experience, that God is sovereign over all things. We're to remember our responsibility is to be faithful to Him in all things despite our circumstances. We're just to trust didn't matter to those Israelites walking around those walls. Listen, guys, we're going to go out and march. Well, what are we going to do? We're going to march seven times around, around Jericho, and then we're going to blow trumpets. We're going to shout. The walls are going to come down. Okay, well, let's go march. It's just trusting the Lord, just trusting the Lord. We're to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ by being content to leave the results, to leave our conditions, our situation, our circumstances to him and to be joyful and content in the Lord, no matter what they are, what the Lord has for you or what the Lord does. That kind of commitment, that kind of joy is so honoring to the Lord. It's such a, a beautiful and appealing adornment of our doctrine, right? To see genuine Christians who respond in their circumstances in that way. Just beautiful because it flows out of an understanding of God, an understanding of the scripture, that peace which passes all understanding and it beautifully magnifies the Lord in us. I had the, the joy of being able to go out yesterday and visit with a brother and sister who going through a tough time, right? We have a lot of brothers and sisters in our church and at one point or another, we go through difficulty. We go through tough times. This brother and sister, you know, it, it looks for the time being like things are just crumbling down around them, going through a really hard time. And yet it's <laughs> such a blessing to me in the way that they respond in that circumstance. Just joyful in the Lord, just trusting the Lord. In talking to them, just not a doubt in their minds that the Lord is gonna care for them and take care of this. Content in whatever the Lord brings along into their circumstances, into their situation. Just at peace and at joy in the Lord despite very difficult circumstances. It is a just a glorious testimony. It magnifies the Lord Jesus Christ to see that in a humble servant, a humble Christian, a disciple of the Lord. It's beautiful. You know, it's that kind of, that kind of joy 
that kind of contentment, right? That kind of faith that John Wesley saw in the Moravians when he took a trip from Europe to the American colonies in 1736. John the Wesley, a member of the Holy Club, you know, preaching the word of God already, unconverted, not saved. He got on that boat, went through difficulty, went through storm, and saw that contentment, that joy, that humility, and that faith in those Moravians as they magnified the Lord Jesus Christ with their trust in him through difficulty, with their joy through difficulty. And it was that experience of seeing the Lord Jesus Christ so magnified in their lives that led John Wesley to realize that he wasn't saved. He didn't have it. And he saw that as a fruit of the Spirit. And that led John Wesley not only to realize that he wasn't saved, but it led to his conversion. The Lord opened his eyes through that, seeing the Lord magnified in their contentment, their faith, their trust, their joy. It's a beautiful example of how the Lord is magnified through your life when you trust in the Lord. That kind of contentment only comes with a spirit-enlightened understanding of God's word, who God is, who you are, God's sovereignty, your responsibility. And with that, we're to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ with our understanding. We see that in, in John chapter 23, verse 27 and 28. John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. That kind of contentment, joy, faith, comes out of an understanding of God's word, an understanding of God's sovereignty, our role, our position in it. And that's what led John to live with contentment and joy despite his circumstances. John knew that whatever we have or whatever situation that we're in, however great we may or may not be, comes none from man's power or man's strength or man's intellect. It doesn't come from man. Everything that we have comes from the Lord. Every gift, whether great, modest, or even absent, comes from the Lord. Every circumstance, easy or moderate or rough, all comes from the Lord. Regarding God's provision and his providence, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, he says, For who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, then why do you boast as if you had not received it? Everything we have comes from God. Everything you have, not everything comes, to, comes from God dressed up like a gift. You know, in John chapter 19, you see Jesus at his crucifixion talking to Pilate. And Pilate says, do you not understand that I have the power to crucify you or to release you? Pilate had been given that power. Jesus responds to him and says, you don't have anything that you've not been given from above. It doesn't always come dressed up like a gift, but it's from God. And we're to be content in our circumstances and trust him. So then if God is sovereign, if he works all things together for our good, which is what, exactly what the Bible says, if everything we have, including every good and perfect gift, comes from him, if we understand that his plans for us are perfect, then we need to be content. We need to put our faith and trust in him. We need to apply ourselves to the means of grace that he has provided and we need to petition him to have that understanding in our circumstances by which we may magnify the Lord Jesus Christ with our joy and with our contentment. We need to put our faith in him. You know, think about this truth from another perspective. Hopefully you didn't come here today to waste a couple of hours, right? But if the Lord doesn't give you what you need, if the Lord doesn't give you understanding, if the Lord doesn't shed his grace on you, that's exactly what it will be. It'll be a waste of a couple of hours. Everything you have comes from the Lord. So when you listen to God's word, you're responsible to pursue it, to ask the Lord for understanding, to engage in the sermon so the Lord would be pleased to give you understanding, to give you wisdom. Come here with the expectation that you're going to pursue Christ, to pursue magnifying the Lord Jesus Christ and petition the Lord to give you understanding. This shouldn't be a waste. You should engage yourself in pursuing the Lord. If you miss preaching of the word of God, the teaching of the word of God, you're wasting opportunity that the Lord is giving you. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. God gives you 
the gift of the means of grace. Are you availing yourself of that? When preaching and teaching is going on, if you don't go, you're wasting an opportunity given you by God himself. When you don't plan to spend time evangelizing, you're wasting an opportunity that God has given to you to be sanctified, to be grown, to be matured. You're wasting opportunities given you by God. If you don't attend Sunday school, if you don't attend or listen to the evening service, you're wasting opportunities given you by God. However, here in John chapter 3, John didn't just resign to accept his circumstances. He didn't just concede that this was how things were going to be. He rejoiced in his circumstances. And we see that, that he magnifies the Lord with his joy in verse 29 magnifies the Lord with his joy. He says in verse 29, he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, John says, this joy of mine is complete. John's joy in verse 29 is founded in being used by God for God's purposes. And we see a joy and we see the Lord magnified in her joy when we're just used by God, right? That's the kind of joy that John had. The very thing that caused envy and discontentment in John's disciples caused complete joy in John. And the illustration that he uses here to communicate this joy is a wedding, a wedding. The bridegroom is Jesus Christ. The bride has always represented God's people. And the friend of the bridegroom here, the best man, so to speak, is John the Baptist. Back then, the best man would have done far more than the best man today. The best man took care of the entire wedding arranged the entire wedding, arranged and presided over the feast, passed out all the invitations, made sure that everyone was going to come. And the last thing that the best man did was to guard the chambers of the bride until the bridegroom would come to her. And when the bridegroom came, their joy was fulfilled. And in their joy being fulfilled, his joy was complete. The joy of the friend of the bridegroom, the joy of the best man. And we're about to have a wedding around here. I'm already excited. I'm looking forward to it. I just love to see that. Uh, our, we have joy in that, don't we? Here, how much more so with Christ? It's just the, the, the joy of the friend of the bridegroom was in fulfilling his responsibility to the bride and groom. You know, fulfilling his responsibility in the wedding. He took great joy in serving in that way. John has said that he isn't worthy to even unloose the sandal of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet it was a privilege, not being unworthy, he was unworthy to do it, and yet considered it a privilege that a sinner such as himself, so much a privilege that was greater than he deserved. Here in his role, he acts as a friend of the bridegroom. We're not worthy to unloose Jesus' sandal, and yet we've been privileged to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in a way that we don't deserve. To be in the same joy that John had in leading people, pointing people to Christ, we enter into that same joy, that same privilege, which we're not worthy, don't deserve to be a part of. We can have that same joy when we lead people to Jesus Christ. It's a great privilege in serving him. It's that humble joy that magnifies the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a, a beautiful picture of this. We don't have time to go there but of the relationship between Jonathan and David in 1 Samuel chapter 18, where Jonathan, a son of the king, in line to take the throne, right? And David comes along. And Jonathan, set to inherit the kingdom, sees God work through David. David kills the Philistine Goliath before his very eyes. So Jonathan could have become envious. Jonathan could have become discontent. He could have been disheartened at being displaced in the way that he was about to be displaced, but not Jonathan. Jonathan, it says in the Bible, loved David. It says that in spite of this, that Jonathan, his soul was knit to the, sa the soul of David and he loved David as his own soul. That Jonathan, content with the plans of God, content with what God was doing through David and joyful in it, took his own princely robes off, took his belt, his sword, his bow, and he gave them to David. And then covenanted with David and served David even to his own hurt. Tremendous humility, tremendous joy, tremendous understanding of God's sovereignty, 
And think about the wealth that Jonathan would have had as king, about all the praise he would have gotten as king, right? All the achievements that would have come, the satisfaction, the fame, all passing pleasures. They don't last. Your passing pleasures don't last either. There is no satisfaction ultimately in those things. It's in those things that are eternal. That's where our joy resides. Our joy resides in serving the Lord. Boyce, J.M. Boyce says that real joy comes in being able to say to Jesus Christ, here I am, Lord, use me. Then finding in that the grace of God that he can actually use you, a wicked sinner, to bring others to Christ. If you pursue that joy, that joy is going to be great. That joy is great. It's also here that John the Baptist is described as he who stands and hears the bridegroom's voice. We have that joy today, right? Standing and hearing the bridegroom's voice. Lastly, we're to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ with humility. Verse 30, John says, he must increase, but I must decrease. That's a summary of the Christian life. A humble resolution to keep yourself and your interests out of the way. And day by day, the Lord Jesus Christ increasing in you. There's a story of seminary students from America that were traveling to London at the time of C.H. Spurgeon. Uh, and he was preaching there at the Metropolitan Tabernacle. And these students were heading off for London. And friends of them here in America told them, when you get to London, there are two people, two preachers you need to go and listen to, Joseph Parker and Charles Spurgeon. They didn't know either one of them, but they committed that when we got to London, they would go hear Joseph Parker and C.H. Spurgeon. So when they were on, in London on the Lord's Day, they went first in the morning to hear Joseph Parker. And they said to themselves after the morning service, they said, without a doubt, it must be said that Joseph Parker is the greatest preacher to have ever preached a sermon. It was wonderful. And they had all but decided they would go back and hear Joseph Parker again in the evening. It was so good. But they remembered their commitment. They said, well, this evening we'll go and hear Charles Spurgeon. So they heard Spurgeon that evening and said, after listening to Charles Spurgeon preach, without a doubt, it must be said that Jesus Christ is the greatest Savior and ourselves the vilest sinners. It's what everyone in Christ wants to be able to say, keep themselves out of the way, to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. Talk about him, post about him, refer to him in every email, every conversation, witness for him, introduce others to him, reserve time in your schedule for him, keep competing self-interests out of the way. Make little of yourself so that the Lord Jesus Christ might be magnified. If you're here today and you've never bowed your knee to him, never bowed your heart to turn from your sin, to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, to bow your will to him, humble yourself now that the Lord Jesus Christ might be magnified in you. He is worthy to be magnified. Stop exalting yourself. Stop magnifying yourself. Accept the truth about yourself from the scripture. There is nothing good that dwells in you. Put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ that he might be magnified through your life. It's the purpose for which you were created. You're created to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. The only joy, the only commit contentment you'll ever have is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to him now. Let's pray. Father in heaven, how we praise you and thank you for your word. Thank you for these truths. And God, I pray they would find fertile soil in our hearts whereby we, in the power of your spirit and by the grace that you afford, God, serve you fervently and faithfully, rubbing away for the Lord that allocation of time that you've given to us for his praise and worship. In Jesus' name, amen.